Hello people and welcome back to another Late Night Reading by Jed Skeptic. We're going to continue the book Ireland Land of the Pharaohs and we're at the chapter The Egyptian Connection. I've already read part one so this is part two people. And just a little disclaimer, I've seen some of the comments. This book isn't my view. Um, I, I'm not pushing this ideology. All I'm doing is reading a book and take what you will from it. I've already found discrepancies as I've been reading. I've not pointed them all out. I'll do that at the end. I'll make my own conclusion at the end of this book. And a wee summary of uh, what I think of the theories through it. Um, but this doesn't align with my ideology. There's bits and pieces there, don't get me wrong. But um, there's a lot of speculation here. And there's a lot of um, references to the Matrix and all this kind of stuff that I, don't, I wouldn't have in a book if I was going to write a book. Um, anyway, without further ado, people, this is the Egyptian Connection. And we're at Moses and Akhenaten. That Moses was at the very least contemporary with Akhenaten is hardly in doubt. Sigmund Freud was one of the first modern authors outside the mystery schools to point out the similarities between their beliefs. Freud claims in his book Origins of Religion that Akhenaten was an inspiration for the religious beliefs of Moses. In his last book, Moses and Monotheism, he argues that it was Moses as an Egyptian and a follower of Akhenaten who later led the Hebrews out of Egypt. Harvey Spencer Lewis, past imperit imperator of Amark, concurs with Freud. It was while Akhenaten was Pharaoh that the children of Israel dwelt in Egypt and the leaders of those tribes became initiates of the Great White Brotherhood. It was at this time that Moses, as one of the initiates, became acquainted with the fundamentals of the religion, which he afterwards modified to present to those who followed him out of Egypt into Palestine. It was also to Akhenaten that Moses made his appeal for aid in taking the tribes of Israel out of Egypt, and it was through the aid thus given by Akhenaten and by the Great White Brotherhood in secrecy that the tribes of Israel evaded the heathen priesthood and had a safe journey. We tentatively introduced the theory that Akhenaten and Moses could actually have been the same person and that it was Akhenaten and his followers, Egyptian Israeli tribes, who fled Egypt. Whatever the argument for this, their knowledge undoubtedly came from the same source. Ralph Ellis points out 14 similarities between the teachings of Akhenaten and the Israeli religion going on to say, these similarities demonstrate that the Egyptian religions and, specifically, the religion of Akhenaten did not die. They escaped during the exodus and have evolved into the familiar forms of today. It could be argued that religion we have today, if this is what Ralph is referring to, is at best a corrupted form of Akhenaten's teachings, which in origin is mystery school teachings. Delving into the esoteric archives does not throw any more light on the question. The only reference to connect the two is Moses' contact with school, where Akhenaten was a student. Moses contacted the secret brotherhood and became converted to its belief in one God. He believed the so-called tribes of Israel to be more advanced than the average Egyptian and therefore more likely to accept the belief in the existence of one God. However, he was not always as successful as he had hoped to be. Manetho, a native Egyptian historian of the 3rd century BCE, lends support to the arcane records and claims that Moses was a student of the mystery schools at Heliopolis, which was also one of the centres of the secret brotherhood. It is said that the priests who framed their Israelis' connection, constitution and their laws was a native of Heliopolis named Osaraseph, after the god Osiris, worshipped at Heliopolis, but when he joined his people, he changed his name and was called Moses. Any impartial research into the roots of Jewish and Christian religions must conclude, as Freud did, that the origins of both these so-called monotheistic belief systems are deeply rooted in the teachings of Akhenaten. To underscore this premise, we might consider the argument from a radical Christian viewpoint. Reverend Robert Taylor, in his book, The Diagesis, was candid enough to recognise that the Christian religion was uniquely Egyptian and did not originate in Jerusalem, 
conceivably the reason he was jailed in 1892. Surely then, it is only for want of moral fortitude and an unwillingness to embrace truth's contrary to preconceived prejudices that hinders man from seeing truth so evident as this, as that this Essian or Theraputin sect itself were, as Eusebius has honestly admitted them to be, Christians, that Alexandria and not Jerusalem was the cradle of the infant church. Reverend Taylor writes elsewhere in his book, it was here that the Essenes dwelt principally long before the coming of Christ. Motion, volume 1, page 196. It was not the first glance nor a cursory observance that will sufficiently admonish the reader of the immense historical wealth put into his hand by the stupendous admission. Bind it about thy neck, write it upon thy tablet of thy heart. Everything of Christianity is of Egyptian origin. Does this not demonstrate the teachings that emerged from Egypt with Moses and the children of Israel were acceptable to thinking men and women in all religions, of all races and all ages, and were indeed the progenitor of the modern Christian religion? If we allow for the fact that it was Akhenaten who first proclaimed the one God, then it follows that Exodus had to take place during his reign, or later and not before. There was a limited period when this could have happened, or put it another way, there was a tiny window in Egyptian history when the light of the one God shone, but albeit for a brief moment in time, before being snuffed out. This window of opportunity had to be during the period that both Akhenaten and Moses lived. We remind ourselves that the Imperator of Amarch, Spencer Lewis, quoting from the secret records, wrote, it was also to Akhenaten that Moses made his appeal for aid in taking the tribes of Israel out of Egypt, and it was through the aid thus given by Akhenaten and by the priesthood and had a safe journey. It is recognised that this is a simplistic argument, but sometimes it is in simplicity we find the truth. As to the theory of Moses and Akhenaten being the same person, this still requires more research. However, there is ample circumstantial evidence to show the hypothesis in a favourable light. For example, if the name Moses is compared to the names of an earlier 18th dynasty priest, Pata and Mose, we can see a connection. Many of the pharaohs of the 18th dynasty, including the founder Amose, bore his name. Akhenaten's grandfather and great-grandfather were both named Thutmoses, and according to author Graham Phillips, Akhenaten's elder brother was Thutmoses, and finally the greatest of the artists, Akhenaten, was named Thutmoses. It seems also that this name, Moses, was only popular during the 18th dynasty. It cannot be found in any of the other Egyptian dynasties. One of the presumptions associated with his name is that it meant to draw forth from water. Egyptologist Flinders Petrie says it is an Egyptian word for sun. With these clues and taking into account what the mystery schools teach, it looks certain that Moses was an Egyptian. Moreover, there is little doubt the teachings of Akhenaten and Moses, because they are so similar, must have come from the same source. If they were not the same person, they certainly were contemporaries, both products of the schools of the Great White Brotherhood. Having almost completed the research for this chapter, there came to my attention a book, referred to above, called Moses, Pharaoh of Egypt, The Mystery of the Akhenaten Resolved. This book by Ahmed Osmond, whom it my pleasure to exchange ideas with in person, is probably at this time the definitive book on the relationship between Akhenaten and Moses. If you'd like to further your knowledge in this area, the writings of this author are essential reading. Exodus Having established a working hypothesis that the connections between Akhenaten and Ireland are through the mysterious Egyptian-Israeli tribes, Atlantean and mystery school teachings, we will build on this by introducing into our story Akhenaten's daughter, Meritaten, Meritaten Tasheret. According to Lorraine Evans in her book The Kingdom of the Ark, Meritaten was or became known as the mysterious Princess Scotta, female warrior leader of the tribes that fled Egypt towards the end of her father's reign. Princess Scotta gave her name to the race that became known as the Scots-Irish. It was she that led her people back to Ireland to complete the cyclic migrations of her mysterious race. 
Evans gives the date for the departure of Meditatin from Egypt as 1350 BCE, which roughly coincides with the fall of Akhenaten as Pharaoh. Permit me to break from our story to recount a personal antidote of a strange experience, one of many during the writings of this narrative, that occurred at the time Lauren Evans' book was published. This concerned one night of vivid dreams about a female warrior leader. The only such warrior leader in history, to my knowledge, at that time was Boudicca of the British Aishini tribe. But confusingly, she appeared in my dreams as Scottish. Later that day, a friend, who was more familiar than me about the history of the Scots, called and we discussed the dream. Since my knowledge about Scottish mythology originating in Egypt and its relationship to the development of a race in the land of Scythia and Spain was nil at the time, so it was disappointing when he told me that he had also never heard of a female warrior leader of the Scots. Reluctantly, from my perspective, we dismissed it from the conversation, except in the dream was a result of having too much to eat before bedtime. Astonishingly, a couple of days later, in a superb example of synchronicity, Jim, my friend, returned with a daily newspaper that was serializing Lorraine Evans' book, Kingdom of the Ark. While reading this serialization over the next few days and later her book, it shocked me to realise that there was a notable Egyptologist who was slightly on the fringes, validating my dream, not only about Scotta, but also, from an academic point of view, corroborating my theories about the return leg of the Brune Boyne Exodus. Lorraine's book directed me to paths that were replete with evidence of links between the Scots-Irish and their Egyptian ancestors. Returning to Lorraine Evans' account of Princess Scotta, who she relates was a lost princess and a member of the Egyptian royal family, Evans declares she fled her homeland, persecuted, friendless and landed on the shores of Britain. There was indeed, according to Irish folklore, a princess named Scotta who arrived in Ireland, but it is questionable questionable if she was the same Scotta who left Egypt. There are variant stories about how and at what point in history Scotta and her followers travelled to Ireland, but the importance of this fact for our story is the arrival in Ireland of a race named after Scotta. Later research was to reveal, as far as the exodus of the Egyptian Israeli tribes to the British Isles was concerned, Lorraine's story is not unique. Actually, reports of their adventures are extensive in British-Irish history, if you could only search them out. Evans proposed that Meritatin, the second eldest daughter of Akhenaten and Nefertiti, although Watterson claims she was the eldest, page 50, and her followers, after many setbacks finally arriving in Ireland via Scythia and Spain sometime after the collapse of her father's reign around 1350 BCE, she shows with skilful detective work that a colony of Egyptians settled in the British Isles would claim along the way they metamorphosed from Egyptian Israeli to Scots Irish. To validate her theories, Evans quotes copiously from a 15th century manuscript written by Walter Bower, who was abbot of Inchcombe Abbey. Bower was an extraordinary scholar, having the goodwill of James the Fifth, Sixth, James the Sixth or James the Fourth, James the First of England, which of course links him to the line of Stuart. We'll not be surprised to learn that he was given a commission by James to record the origins of the ancient Scots. He of course arrives at, at the conclusion that the Scots ori originated in Egypt. Bower, according to Evans, claims that ancient Egyptians came to the British Isles and they were led by no less a person than an Egyptian princess, a pharaoh's daughter named Scotta. Lorraine gives a precus by citing Boer. In ancient times, Scotta, the daughter of Pharaoh, left Egypt with her husband, Gaethelos, by name and large following, for they had heard of the disasters which were going to come upon Egypt, and so through the instructions of the gods, by cameral mode, they fled from certain plagues that were to come. They took to the sea, entrusting themselves to the guidance of the gods. After sailing in this way for many days over the sea with troubled minds, they were finally glad to put their boats in at a certain shore because of bad weather. Scotta According to Evans, and her tribe arrived on one of the islands of Albion, White Isles, we know as Ireland, but which also had been known through the ages by a host of different names. Conor McDarry writes, The inland had many names attesting to its spiritual character, but Ireland was not one of them. This name is a living testimony to British perfidy and cupidity 
for they conferred this name upon it. Other names included Erin, Aran in English, and Hibernia. There is possibility that Ireland derives from a corruption of Erin, Aran, becoming Ireland. Another theory says it was from the goddess Ayr, so Ayr land. An esoteric manuscript credited to John of Fordun, a chantry priest in the Cathedral of Aberdeen, alleges that Hyber, King Gethelos, who he claims was a Scottish son, thus appropriated the whole land, Ireland, as a possession for himself and his brethren, calling it Scotia from his mother's name. But afterwards, says a legend, from that same King Hyber, or rather from the Hiberian Sea, they called it Hibernia. John of Fordun's Chronicles deals almost exclusively with Scottish nations' travels from Egypt to Ireland via Spain. In his detailed account of their travels, he relates the story of Scotta and her husband's flight from Egypt, which is spookily similar to Bowers' account. We will see below why this was. It is taught that Scotta, with her husband, followed a large retinue, went forth in terror out of Egypt. Grosse test says, in the olden time, there went out, out of Egypt Scotta, the daughter of Pharaoh, with her husband, by name Gael, and a very large company, for they had heard the evils which were to come upon the Egyptians, and thus through the commands of the answers of the gods, flying from plagues which were to come, they launched out into the sea, entrusting themselves to the governance of their gods, and they, cruising thus for many days through the seas with the wavering minds, at length, on account of the inc inclement weather, were glad to bring up on a certain coast. Evans proposes that Princess Scotia died battling the two Danann at Sleeve Mish and her body was buried in a glen called Glen Scotta, Scotta's Glen, about three miles from Tralee in County Dick Kerry. As we have said, it is a moot question if this warrior princess was the original Scotta. We speculated it was more likely a later princess with the same name, a descendant of Meritatin. In a, in a critique of Lorraine's book for 14 times, March 2001, Simon Young evaluates Lorraine's findings. Lorraine Evans missed some references that would have been helpful to her thesis because the information is so dispersed. It is inevitable that this will happen. Young argues that Evans' work contains serious flaws and that the place to explain Scotta is not Egypt but in Ireland. One of the references he gives for the argument is an old Irish text called the Ever New Tongue. This, according to Young, was a kind of Irish book of the dead, a route map to the afterlife. It had several peculiar details, including, interestingly, a reference to the world being a globe, centuries before such an idea galvanised Copernicus or Galileo. Its most recent editor has claimed that some of these details can be traced back to the ancient Egyptian text, the Amduat, the earliest version of which appears in hieroglyph on the walls of the tomb of Thutmose I, 1505-1493 BC. How the Aduat, Amduat got to Ireland is unknown. It is possible for Young to pose a contrary question, as revealed throughout our story, how the knowledge behind the Amduat got to Egypt is unknown. From our discoveries so far, it will come as no revelation to us that the ancient Irish knew the earth was round. Young also cites another ancient Irish text, the Leba Gabala Erin, the Book of the Taken of Ireland, otherwise known as the Book of Leinster, to reinforce his opinion that Scotta was native to Ireland, but it appears that referring to these manuscripts, he accomplishes the opposite. This manuscript claims that the modern Scots-Irish originated originated in Scythia and were descendants of a King Phineas Farsaid, King of Scythia. It goes on to detail how King Phineas's son, Nell, was born at Nimrod's Tower, Tower of Babel, when the king went out to Asia to assist the building of the said tower and gives another version of how the Scots got their name. Now that is the time when Gadel Glass, from who are the Gadel, was born of Scotta, the Pharaoh. From her are the Scots named Ut Dictum Est. John of Fordun's revelations corresponds with Evans' theories about the Scots arriving in the British Isles from Spain, but gives a different chronicle. It's no surprise Evans' account agrees with that Fordun in its essential points, as he was Bower's predecessor. According to the Cambridge History of English and American Literature, 1907-21, Fordun died in 1385. 
the year, writes Evans, page 20, that Boer was born. Boer, or bowmaker, was Fordun's continuator and drew almost entirely on the work of Fordun. However, the Cambridge history claims the modification of Fordun's research by his continuator, Bower, was garrulous, irrelevant and inaccurate. If we accept this, then Fordun's account would be more accurate. Why Evans didn't refer to his work seems to be an oversight of her, on her part. Fordun suggests it was Hyber, son of Gaethelos and Scotta, who finally settled in Ireland, Scotia, after his father explored the island and admired its goodliness and returned to Br Brigantia, where he was overtaken with sudden death. But before he expired, he exhorts his sons to go to that island. Hyber, therefore, having heard his father's words, went with his brother Hymac to the foreshed island with a fleet and took it, not by force, but untenanted, as some would have it, by a single inhabitant. Some, indeed, relate that giants inhabited the island at first. And this also is Geoffrey of Mammoth's account in his chronicle when commemorating the deeds of Aurelius Ambrosius in the seventh book, where he writes as follows. Geoffroy, send for the giant's ring, said Merlin to Aurelius, which is on Galar Galaraos, a mountain in Ireland, etc. At these words of this, of his, Aurelius burst into laughter, saying, how is it possible to convey the vast stones of that ring from so distant a country as if Britain lacked stones? To this Merlin retorted, Do not, do not, O king, indulge in idle laughter, for my words are not idle. Those stone are mystical and of medicine of virtue. The giants of old brought them away from the furthest coast of Africa and placed them in Ireland while they inhabited that country. The same author continues with Merlin's narrative. Thus spake he, the legend of St. Brandon, says, that one of his sons of Gaethelos, Hyber by name, a young man, but valiant for his years, being incited to war by his spirit, took up arms, and having prepared such a fleet as he could, went to the Forsaid Island and slew a part of the few inhabitants he found, and part he subdued. He thus appropriated the whole land for a possession for himself and his brethren, called it Scotia, from his mother's name. Grossetest writes, and because the princess herself, the most noble, of all who were present was called Scotta, they called that part of the land which they reached first, that is, Oilista, Ulster, Scotia. Another version of the story is well worth examining, is in fact a love story and the account most favoured by the so-called British Israelis. It is believed in some quarters this concept was introduced in the Elizabethan period by the alchemist John Dee, who we saw earlier as a spy, 007. It concerns Heremon, a prince of Scythia, whose ancestors were from Erin, met and married Tamar Tia, the daughter of an unnamed Egyptian pharaoh who had a sister called Scotta. Another version recounts that her father was Zechariah, last king of the Hebrews, Egyptian Israeli tribes, with the biblical prophet Jeremiah and his scribe, Barak. They travelled to Ireland. They brought with them the harp, scepter and the, the lyre fail. This Hebrew word spells the same red backwards. The Lyre Fail is also known as the Stone of Destiny, the Coronation Stone, or the Stone of the Stone of Scone. It is better known today. Tradition says this was the pillow Jacob rested his head on when he dreamed about angels of God ascending and descending a ladder to heaven. It resided at the hill of Tara, place of the Irish high kings for a thousand years. From Tara, this famous stone, representative of God's kingdom, was moved to Scotland's Isle of Iona by King Fergus the Great. Then this stone throne was brought to England by James the Sixth of Scotland, who became James I of England, thus fulfilling the last of the three overturnings of Ezekiel, James IV of Ezekiel 27-21. The stone was kept under the throne in Westminster Abbey, on which the kings and queens of Britain are crowned, that is useless, you believe a story that could put into perspective the importance of the English establishment puts on this stone. The story is related by one, Professor Odlum. He was investigating the stone to ascertain, to ascertain where it came from since tests carried out showed that the stone was not native to the British Isles. He tried to attain permission to get a pea-sized sample of the stone 
to compare with some stone he had found in the Red Sea area, but his emissary to the Dean of Westminster Abbey was informed. I didn't let you have permission. The only way you can get permission would be from the Archbishop of Can Canterbury. Application was made to the Archbishop of Canterbury, and this was the reply from the Archbishop. To take a piece of stone from that stone no bigger than a pea would require a special Act of Parliament to be passed by the House of Commons, endorsed by the House of Lords, and signed by the King. And if you get that, said the Archbishop, I won't give you permission. Scottish nationalists tell an amusing story about Westminster, Coronation Stone. They insist that the stone under the throne in Westminster Abbey is a fake. The yarn they tell is as entertaining as it is incredible. In 1950, three young Scottish nationalist students at Glasgow University made a daring raid in Westminster Abbey to steal the £400 slab from under the coronation chair. A furious manhunt was launched to find the culprits who fled to Scotland with the prize trophy. They were hailed as patriots and the police were led on a series of humility and wild goose chases as nationalists hauled the stone around the country. Four months later, the detectives were allowed to find the stone at Arbroath Abbey and it was whisked ignominiously back to Westminster in a Scotland Yard Black Maria. So this is the stone of scone being toasted by Scottish Knight Templars. And I've seen this so-called stone, but they reckon it's a fake. So I don't know if I've seen the original. Um, but there's one up in Edinburgh Castle, and they claim it's this, the Stone of Destiny. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not too sure. The stone English police rescued was, according to the Scottish Nationals, a fake which was substituted. If this is true then Elizabeth II was never lawfully installed as Queen. But we have already examined the theory that the Windsors, in reality the House of saxe coburg gotha are usurpers anyway. Meanwhile, the real stone was secret secreted from 1972 in the Dundee Church of St Columbus for 17 years until the Church of Scotland authorities closed the church. It was then, in a colourful ceremony, whisked away to a secret new hiding place. Seven Knights Templars in white mantles with red stars stood solemnly as they were earnestly urged to keep this emblem and inspiration, this time-honoured symbol of Scottish nationhood. There we go, guys. See that? The Red Cross. And there we go. The fake Westminster stone was returned to Scotland in 1995 by the permission of the British government. The Westminster authorities of course deny the stone they had was phony. Maybe it was just a coincidence that the Scotland enjoys a form of self-government. Unless the fates are false, the Scots will reign where the fatal stone they find again. Beaumont proposes that Velikovsky concurs the sacred stone. stones are likely debris from the tales of the comets that caused the great catastrophe. Not surprisingly, in the minds of the bicameral races, these stones would have been weapons along with lightning rods used in the hostilities between the gods. Here also is an answer to the riddle of how these massive rocks, some of them over a hundred tons, were supposedly moved over great distances to be erected at certain locations. They, in fact, were assembled where they were found and erected, and as proposed above by giants. More evidence for this will be presented as we progress. The sanctity of such stones, whether as round temples, dolmens, cromlechs, single menhirs or idols, was attributable to the belief that they were of celestial origins, as in fact they were. The significance lies in the fact that these stones had to be erected where found, and without any trimmings. It is further implied that it was their sacred duty to raise such altars on a site where they encountered a cluster of stones and set them up to form such altars, as in the case of cromlechs. I've got a cromlech, guys, right over there. I could probably throw a stone and hit, one, hit my cromlech that's sitting over there. That giant dwelt in the British Isles in a prehistoric day is authenticated by tradition and archaeology. Cornwall is traditionally a formal home of huge men. Their presence preserved in nomenclature at the Trecrobin Hill, Cornwall, where they are found giant's cradle, giant's spoon and giant's well. Tin miners 
at Tregony on the foul found a coffin measuring 11 feet 3 inches by 3 feet 9 inches containing an immense skeleton. If the bicameral people thought these stones came from the gods, then the places where they fell would become sacred sites as we think of them today. There is a particular ancient site in the north of Ireland called the Bali Nahati complex, which encapsulates Beaumont's theory precisely. This is a large earthen enclosure situated in the suburbs of Belfast and called the Giant's Ring. Within this structure there is a passage grave dating from somewhere between 3018 and 2788 BCE. If other dating within the complex is correct, remarkably this religious ritual site resembles a crater. The stone that comprises the actual passage grave in the middle of it are not found anywhere in the neighbourhood of this site. Reviewing the final leg of the Scots-Irish Exodus, there is seen several different chronologies which lead us from Akhenaten's Egypt through Scythia and Spain to Ireland. We discovered an association with the mysterious ten tribes of Israel and the proposed the Exodus is unwittingly celebrated by the Orange Order in Ireland every 12th of July, Old Calendar 1st of July. Coincidentally, there are ten Belfast districts represented in the parade, almost certainly reflecting the ten lost tribes of Israel. Moreover, mythologically, it represents the ten provinces of Atlantis ruled over, according to Plato in the Critias, by ten princes. More similarities are found in the Bible, and with him ten princes of each chief, house a prince throughout all the tribes of Israel, and each one was a head master of the house of their father among the thousands of Israel. The history of the ten lost Israeli tribes is explicitly connected with the Orange Order in all their higher degrees. There is a degree, for example, called the Royal Arch Purple, which is based on the biblical story of the two and a half tribes who separated from the main body and were the first to cross the Jordan. Interestingly, the royal in this degree refers not to the British royalty. The emblems of this degree are an arch demonstrating the ecliptic of the sun, three-step ladder, Jacob ladder, goat, a unicorn, the Masonic five-pointed star, two and a half triangles, heart with a sword, heart cross and anchor, three-branched candlestick, coffin, Bible, sun, moon and stars. If we accept the evidence so far, we must concede that an undisclosed raison d'etre of the Orange Order is to celebrate and keep alive the connections between the ancient Egyptian Israeli tribes in Ireland. Alan Campbell, a graduate of London University and head of religious studies at Campbell College, an elite private college in Belfast, writes, British Israeli believers are and have been for generations members of our three loyal orders, the Orange, Black and the Apprentice Boys. The latter is an organisation that celebrates the actions of the trade apprentices who shut the gates at Derry in 1688 against the forces of James II and started the famous siege. Campbell continues, One of the finest lifelong British Israel believers in Ulster was the late Mr John Bryans, loved and admired by all. He served with distinction as Grand Master of the Orange Institute in Ireland. Here is more evidence that proves within the highest echelons of the Orange Order that there are officers who know their heritage reveals Ireland's Egyptian-Israeli connections and is much more profound and ancient than a relatively recent minor religious squabble. The Orange Order's traditional history is lost in the complexity of chronology where it entangles with other semi-secret orders, but we can trace it with a fair degree of certainty through the Israeli tribes to Akhenaten's Egypt. Supporting evidence in the last two chapters will present us with cre cre credible evidence of these links and show that the orange parades in Belfast exhibit race memories of an ancient people's exodus. They also colourfully celebrate the survival of their ancestors, the sojourn in Egypt and their eventual return to their island homeland and of course the ritual battle at the Boyne. As an aside, it could be argued that the veiled within these theories is a possible solution for the contentious feeder para parades. These ten supplementary parades each leave from one of the ten districts of Belfast to join the main parade in the centre of the city before they head south, reflecting the outward migrations. In a few cases they cross areas where they are not welcome, but if the truth was known about these feeder parades, they could be seen in a different light. Perhaps then both sides could desist from seeing them as 
triumphalist. Instead, they'd be seen as essential to faithfully recreate the diaspora. Everyone could then enjoy the spectacle of a shared history being reenacted in the Mardi Gras fashion. The following anecdote demonstrates how important the Belfast parade is worldwide within the Orange tradition. In 1967, while living in Toronto, a Canadian Orangeman who had never visited Ireland told me one of his goals in life was to participate in the parade in Belfast. It is indeed the mecca of Orange culture worldwide, and if the premises in our story are correct, it seems with good reason. It is not crucial to our chronicle which of the above mentioned migration narratives is the most accurate historically. They all basically tell the same story, with only names and chronologies being slightly different. Sundry stories are cited to show that there was, is, widespread conviction about where the Scots-Irish nation originated. They also demonstrate interaction between the people of Ireland and Egypt from ancient times. These various chronological sagas can be integrated and summarised as follows. An Egyptian princess, Scotta, married a Scythian prince named Heramon or Nell, whose mother's ancestors came from the island of Erin. They, or more likely their descendants, migrated to Ireland via Scythia, Greece and Spain. Other of the Israeli tribes like Dan and Ben that journeyed north were absorbed into continental Europe. This can be seen in many European place names. This royal family, which included a princess Scotta and their retinue, eventually arrived in Ireland, conquered it, their descendants becoming the high kings and queens at Tara, then a beautiful city, so famed in Irish leg legend and ballad as a city of inestimable wealth of places, marble halls, harpists and song. Nowadays there is only a huge mound to be seen. My speculation that it was a descendant of the original Scotta who finally arrived in Ireland finds agreement or at least inferred with the Irish historian Peter Beresford Ellis who states there were at least two Scotters. It was a possibly a descendant of the original Scotter that met her nemesis in Ireland. According to Lorraine Evans, the original Scotter was Akhenaten's daughter and it was this Scotter who was matriarch of and gave her name to the race we claim are now the Scots-Irish. This means a direct descendant of the pharaohs of the 18th dynasty established or in fact re-established their ancient race in Ireland. Princess Scotta's son, Heremon and Heber Scott, finally recaptured all of Ireland from the Tua and later the Picts, an Aboriginal race that inhabited Ireland and Scotland, and divided it between them. Heremon took the north, Ulster, and Heber Scott, the south. Una she Sheehan, an accredited Irish tourist guide, an authority on the history of the Battle of the Boyne and the landscape where it took place, quipped in with one of our discussions about Bruna Boyne. It seems that the Boyne River is like a zip that separates the two parts of Ireland. Perhaps she is closer to the truth than she realises. With the union of these royal families through the marriage of the eastern Scotta to the western Heremon or Nell, another mystery reveals itself and is solved at the same time. This is the mystery of the Clada Ring and the people of the same name. To do this mystery justice, we need a volume of its own, but here are a few brief highlights as they link to our story. The Clada Ring is internationally known as an Irish wedding or friendship ring. Knowledge of the Clada people who lived in and around the city of Galway and who have always had their own king is scant, at least in the popular mind. It is said that when Cromwell was putting the rest of Ireland to the sword, he told his generals to leave the Clada in peace. An interesting story from the Galway Official Guide of 1961, page 59, shows another relatively modern connection between Ireland and Egypt. It is a copy of a report from Stratford Eyre, Governor of Galway in 1747, to the Lord Lieutenant on the state of affairs in Galway. He intriguingly states, The Egyptians outnumber us 30 to 1, while documented in the above. Synchronicity struck again when a friend gave me a video recording of a documentary that appeared on RTE, Irish television, about the people who lived around the Atlantic Rim and their connection with each other, including the Calada people, the Clada people. In this documentary entitled The Atlanteans, it was plainly shown the ancient connections, mainly established by sea trading, 
between the west coast of Ireland, North Africa and Spain. Similarities between the Clada people's culture and various North African cultures in music, art and boat building, as well as the similarity in looks and customs are truly remarkable. A tailpiece to this documentary relates to an incident when Navin Fort and Co. Arma, Awan, Maka, twins of Maka, in mythology, the royal residence of the kings of Ulster and the Red Branch Knights, Sarah's line, see below, was being excavated. The archaeologists had a surprise, for beneath seven metres of earth they found a skeleton of a Barbary ape, a native of North Africa, which is dated to the Iron Age, around 500 BCE. The Clada ring symbolises, as indeed does symbolic aspects of the ritual battle, the reuniting of the Royal House of Judah with the Royal House of Israel, Scotta and Nell in Ireland. This healed a breach that had occurred at the birth of Tamar and Judah's twin sons of Zara and Faraz, related in Genesis chapter 38. It is in this perplexing, symbolic, biblical story that we discover the origins of the Red Hand, the emblem of Ulster, and again we observe the connections between the myths of Ireland, Israel and Judah merge. This biblical plot relates that Judah had three sons, Er, Onan and Shelah. Judah married his eldest son to a woman named Tamar. For some reason, not explained, Er was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. The narrative continues with Judah giving his second son, Onan, in marriage to Atamar, to Tamar, saying, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and rise up seed to thy brother. The next two verses need to be quoted in full. Verse 9, And Onan knew that the seed should not be his, and it came to pass, when he went into his brother's wife, that he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. Verse 10, And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. It is puzzling as to what Onan and his brother did that was so wicked they deserved to die, not for spilling sperm surely. We will see presently there could be another context to these seemingly senseless deaths. Meanwhile, Judah belatedly awakens to the fact that something is going on drastically wrong when he gave his sons in marriage to Tamar. He refuses, therefore, to give up his youngest son, Shelah, to a similar fate, making the excuse that he is too young. To placate Tamar, he promises that when Shelah is older, he will consent to their marriage. Sometime later, however, Tamar realises that Judah is not going to keep his word and so lays a trap for him. She dresses as a harlot, sits by the side of the road where she knows Judah will be passing and entices him him to have sex with her. He apparently does so without somehow realising it's his dead son's wife. About three months later he learns that Tamar is pregnant. At first he orders her to be burnt to death but when she proves to him that he is the father he says, she has been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Shelah my son. Judah withdraws his death threat, and she eventually gives birth to twin boys. When the time arrived for Tamar to give birth, it came to pass that the one that put his hand out and the midwife took and bound upon his red hand a scarlet thread, saying, this came out first. She obviously did this to show the importance of the firstborn, the early red hand of Ulster, had around the wrist a scarlet laurel wreath. In later years, it was three drops of blood fallen from the wrist, a Hebrew motif. The Genesis story goes on to relate in verses 29 and 30. And it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brothers came out, and she said, How hath thou broken forth? This breach be unto you. Therefore his name was called Faraz. And afterwards came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand and his name was called Zara. Curiously, these names are very similarly spelt backwards. Zera, Zerap, Faraz. According to biblical scholar Herbert W. Armstrong, in the original Hebrew language, vowels were never given in the spelling. The sound of the vowels had to be supplied in the spoken word. Of course, so that A and the E in these names are arbitrary. This, then, is the origin of the Irish Clada Ring and the Red Hand of Ulster, and is yet another link in the chain that binds Ireland to Egypt and the so-called Holy Lands. Where the true Holy Lands are will be discussed later on, possibly in another volume. The more popular accepted legend connects the Red Hand with the O'Neills, 
one time rulers of Ulster, it tells of a competition involving a boat race, the prize being the kingship of Ulster to the one who reached the land first. In this legend, O'Neill is loosened, but cuts off his hand and throws it onto the shore, thus ensuring he was the first to touch land, from which comes the symbol of the red hand. John Vinnicombe, an authority of heraldic devices, says, however, the early legend of the cutting off the hand, left hand and throwing it ashore is not of any account. Whether the red hand is a left or right hand has always been a bone of contention. We will give John Vinnicombe the last word on it. The red hand of Ulster is a paradox quite to baronets to said to belong. If, if they use the left hand, they're sure to be right, and to use the right hand would be wrong. For the province, a different custom applies, and just the reverse is the rule. If you use the right hand, you'll be right safe and wise. If you use the left hand, you're a fool. Earlier evidence demonstrates there is a high likelihood that the people who lived at Bruna Boyne were knowledgeable about genetics. This being the case, and as we have been following the exportation of the knowledge to Egypt, it is more than possible that the Israeli tribes coming out of Egypt and whose leaders were Egyptian would also have had similar knowledge to this. The earlier biblical narrative about Zara and Faraz would then be taken on a different hue and would give us a possible explanation for these seemingly senseless deaths, that is, if the whole story was linked to genetics. Was it possible that there was being hinted at was indeed an elementary form of genetic engineering having gone astray? For a comprehensive thesis on ancient genetic engineering, see Lawrence Gardner's Genesis of the Grail Kings, 1998, or David Wood's Gen Isis, 1985. If the reader finds my theories incredible, a, per a, peru a perusal of these two volumes will show them in a more favourable light. Wood and Gardner's hypotheses are more credible than a lord that kills on a whim. Until we properly understand the workings of the ancient mind, we will not be able to comprehend our true story. Traces of these extraordinary Egyptian-Israeli tribes who fled Egypt can be found all over Europe along the routes of the return to their ancient homeland. The British Isles, the true promised land, evidence of their journey can be seen in the names of the cities and countries they established. Zaragoza in Spain is one of the more obvious regions they passed through. Other waymarks, the signature of the tribe of Dan, or Denmark, Danmark or the Mark of Dan, and the ancient Irish tribe the Tu. Tutha da Danan, which translates means tribe of Dan. Another interpretation of this appellation is given by Peter Dawkins as a tribe of the goddess whose name was Dana. They are referred to at other times as the Tooth Day, meaning people of God. There is a possibility the song Danny Boy refers to this tribe. Vowels in the original Hebrew, as we have already discussed, are not written. The word Dan would in English translate literation be spelt din dn which might be pronounced as dun din don or den in ireland this would reveal itself as dundalk donegal dingle and in scotland dundee dunraven and the ancient don valley in europe the rivers don danube dinster dinista are all situated in or near ancient scythia Caesarea. The evidence for the migration of people from North Africa and Spain to Ireland is so overwhelming that it should be common knowledge. Unfortunately, education in our own history is sadly lacking. However, the migrations from Egypt to Ireland were all well established in the Scots-Irish psyche and in their symbols and rituals. Given what has been revealed thus far, it is hardly surprising to discover that the people who built the pyramids were the descendants of the people that had built Newgrange. Mr. Lewis Spence, whose learning and scholarship are considerable, claims that Egyptian pyramids, like the Mastabas, were influenced and even introduced by a stone-using people from the West who erected cairns, menhirs, cromlechs, dolmens and chambered tumuli. His case is that the pyramids were a later development of the megalithic people, and if he be correct, it naturally ensures that Westerners must have been the first to carry the type of civilization which we see in its full development along the valley of the Nile. Secret societies. As the ancient tribes left Egypt, many of the sages, Great White Brotherhood, 
went with them, leaving a corps to carry on the teachings in Egypt, White Lodge, and it was this priesthood, according to the, some authors later known as the Priory of Zion, that spawned all modern secret societies we are familiar with, and some that are not so familiar. Recall what Spencer Lewis said about them. They were permitted to adopt such names as were significant in the various languages or symbolical to the peoples with whom they had to deal. In Egypt, they tried in vain to protect their beloved Pharaoh Akhenaten, his teachings and his family. Today, many believe the reason for their existence is to protect another special family line called by Tim Wallace Murphy, Rex Deus. But that's another story. As the Dark Ages re receded, the secret teachings from the nowadays abandoned schools of Egypt were gradually released into the public domain. This can be seen taking place at regular intervals in history. Coincidentally, almost all major advancements in science and the arts has come from students, initiates of the mystery schools, initiates like Isaac Newton, English astronomer, mathematician and philosopher, Michael Faraday, considered to be the father of physics, Benjamin Franklin, statesman, author and celebrated inventor, and so the list goes on to include other great individuals such as Da Vinci, Galileo, Descartes, Debussy, Flood, the father of Freemasonry, and John Dalton, expounder of Dalton's Law of Proportions. It was the same mystery schools that gave birth to the Greek classical golden age that produced such philosophical geniuses as Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and many other great thinkers and practitioners of the arts and sciences. Many of these Greek scholars had at some time in their lives made contact with one of the Egyptian centres of learning, such as that of Alexandria. Plato was only the latest of many Greek philosophers who went to Egypt to study. According to the Christian Bible, it was also where Mary and Joseph took Jesus for his safety after the threat from Herod. It was here also that he was later to be instructed by masters of the Great White Brotherhood. Solon, 630-560 to BCE, the Athenian poet and lawmaker, visited Egypt and returned to Greece with the Atlantean narrative, the source of Plato's story about this lost continent. As has been suggested earlier, it might be more beneficial at this moment if we were to understand the Atlantean myths as being a state of consciousness that was dispersed over much of the known world at a particular time in history. Like the Eden myth, it's much easier to understand the Atlantean civilization as a metaphor than an actual kingdom situated on a mystical, mythical island, even though there is lots of circumstantial evidence to show that there could have been such an island kingdom. It was this hy hy hypothetical island continent, according to what Solon was told by the Egyptian priesthood, that spawned an advanced race of people who eventually arrived in Egypt after the catastrophe to found its golden age. The great architect, Imhotep, was of these tribes, which both Bowman and Waddell postulate came from the direction of the northwest Atlantic. Esoteric records relate he was the vizier and great architect of King Zosa. He constructed the latter's pyramid tomb and other great edifices. He was related to have been one of the sage, great sages of history, learned in many arts and in esoteric knowledge. Imhotep was a typ typical example of this great northern race. Continuing our travels forward in history and journeying north westwards, we see numerous examples of the mystery schools at work, from the Reformation to the 18th century Enlightenment. Probably the best example of this was during the peak of the Renaissance in the 16th century when mystery school initiates were at the forefront of dispensing the secret teachings. Our old friends Dr John Dee and Francis Bacon, diplomat, philosopher and father of the scientific method, were prominent along with Ben Johnson, 1572-1637, and Christopher Marlowe, 1564-1593. Bacon was a grand master of the Rosicurian order, he was assigned the fictitious name of Christian Rosenkreutz, meaning a Christian of the Rosy Cross. Peter Dawkins, in his extensive writings and researches on Francis Bacon, builds a convincing case that the Shakespeare's plays are actually the work of Bacon. Raymond Bernard is one of the many who agree with Dawkins. In Ignatius Donnelly's great cryptogram, the secret story of Bacon's life is revealed. Obtained from the cipher message hidden in the Shakespeare's folio, describing his authorship of the plays which returned over to the actor Shakespeare, 
a most interesting piece of direct evidence of the Baconian authorship of Shakespeare plays is the Shakespeare Monument in Westminster Abbey, which has been erected by Pope. The statue is graced by the head of Francis Bacon. The stockings are engraved with the Tudor roses and a crown. According to Dawkins, Bacon was a secret son of Queen Elizabeth I and her husband Robert Dudley, the Duke of Leicester. Dawkins speculates that they were married in a secret ceremony. Bacon's many writings under his own name include New Atlantis, 1625, a metaphor referring to the setting up of a new cycle of the mystery schools in 16th century America. He was also, by implication, identifying the irrationality of the collective, collectivist captured society in which he was living, in contrast to a free individualised society that New America was destined to become. It is obvious that the fledging states of America were established using the teachings that Bacon and Akhenaten taught, which are also Templar and Rosicurian teachings. It is a fact that most of the American founding fathers were mystery school initiates, probably Masons and Rosicurians. Not only were many of the founders of the United States government Masons, but they received aid from a secret and august body of existing in Europe, which helped them to establish this country for a peculiar and particular purpose known only to the initiated few. The Great Seal is the signature of the exalted body, unseen and for the most part unknown, and the unfinished pyramid upon its reverse side is trestle board, setting forth symbolically the task to the accomplishment of which the United States government was dedicated from this day of its inception. Various religious fundamental groups and conspiracy theorists of the more extreme mindset claim this was for the nefarious purpose of world dominance, which is difficult to reconcile with reason if the American Constitution is ex examined. Hopefully all will become clear when it is discovered that the American Republic was established to reflect the glory of free conscious beings manifesting in the divine universe. The reality that mystery schools were the power behind the founding fathers is not as outlandish as might seem. Some European countries, it was mooted earlier, were set up with help from the mystery schools as defence in their continuing battle against the dark forces. It is believed that they were instrumental in the fomenting of the revolution that led to the French Republic, which unfortunately spiralled out of control. Researchers Alan Butler and Stephen Defoe propose that the Templars established Switzerland as a Templar homeland. The focus of Butler and Defoe's investigations was to show that the Templars had escaped their believed destruction in 1307 CE. Virtually intact, and that, in a very direct sense, they may be one of the most potent forces at work in the world at the start of the new millennium. When we started our journey, it was my belief that there were perhaps two or three countries in the world sponsored by secret orders. It was surprising to find that the hand of the mystery schools behind America and most Western European countries, Butler and Defoe, make a convincing case for Switzerland being a perfect example of this nation building. They show a selection of flags and banners from the Swiss regions, all displaying Templar symbols. Particular emphasis is put on the flag of Zurich, Hong, to underline this connection, but for my money the flag of Freiburg, Freiburg is the most convincing, not least because it is similar to my own family's coat of arms, as well as being the Templar's battle flag, the Byzant. Another country that is central to this aspect of our story is Ulster, modern Northern Ireland, which from its earliest days has been a bulwark of the secret orders against their old foes in the Vatican that had captured the rest of Ireland. The people of Ireland were caught in the middle of this ancient feud. Perhaps one day we will discover that what we have witnessed in world history is a long-standing struggle for control that we may never fully understand. Nevertheless, this axiom encapsulates the foregoing perfectly. The history of the world is the history of the warfare between secret societies. Ishmael Reed, Mumbo Jumbo. The supposed annihilation of the Templars took place on Friday the 13th, October 1307, the origin of Black Friday when sudden bad luck is supposed to strike. It was on this day that Philip Philip the Fair of France initiated with the support of Pope Clement V 
a series of raids against the Templar preceptories in France with the intention of destroying them and capturing the legendary treasures. Let us review the history of these warrior knights from some unusual sources. Peter Halen, in his Cosmography of the World, 1660, says that among the chief orders of knighthood in the Kingdom of Jerusalem was the Knights of the Temple or the Templars. Their unsigned was a red cross. They possessed no less than 16,000 lordships. The house of our law students in London, called the Temple, was the chief of the Knights of this order in England. William R. Singleton, a 33 degree Mason in the History of Freemasonry, Volume 5, page 1 and 320, 1839, writes, Hugo de Paganus, Payens, after arriving in Palestine as a crusader and pilgrim, finding that the Muslim inhabitants infested the approaches to Jerusalem and other sacred places and persecuted such pilgrims as were not in sufficient numbers to protect themselves, gathered with them eight other companions, Godfrey de St. Aldemar, Rorol, Gundemar, Godfrey Bistel, de Mont Didier, Archibald de St. Amon, Andrew de Montbar, and the Count of Provence and bound themselves to the Patriarch of Jerusalem in AD 1118 to guard the approaches to the Holy City so that pilgrims to the sacred places might have easy access. Their first appearance in history finds them purportedly guarding pilgrims in the Holy Land. In reality, they spent their time digging under the temple looking for an undefined treasure for nine years, probably from 1109. World history first becomes aware of them in the year 1118. They had the rules conferred upon them by the great initiate and founder of the religious order of the Cistercians, St. Bernard, in 1127. In 1119, Hugo de Pagnes became the first master. The palace of the Latin kings of Jerusalem, which had been a mosque on Mount Morai, Moria, which mount constitutes now the Haram S. Sheriff, and then was known as Solomon's Temple, was assigned to them as their quarters. King Solomon's Temple, known today as the Mosque of Omar or Kabet S. Sacra, Dome of the Rock, was erected over the great rock of Moriah. It was at this place that Abraham was going to sacrifice his son Isaac. Underneath this rock was a secret cave where the Templars held sacred rituals. These knights had seen action under the leadership of Godfrey de Bullion, who had captured Jerusalem in 1099, 1100 CE. He died the following year. The knights of the temple developed into a semi-monastic order devoted to protecting shrines and places of worship and supposedly given succour to those who journeyed to such places. How nine knights could this is never explained. The secret motto was Omne Solom, Forte Patri Est. Every soil is a brave man's country. In the year 1136, upon the transition of the first Grand Master, Hugh de Paganas, Robert de Creo, a nephew of Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury, and an exponent of the philosophical school of realism, became second Grand Master of the Templars. It was about this time another, but less well-known order, entered into the stage of history for the first time. They were the Militia Crucifera Evangelica, a militant body of defenders of a religious thought and practice sworn to keep the cross sacred as a symbol. They originated as an offshoot of the Essence, and the re records show that a detachment were sent to the Languedoc to aid Count Raymond in the defence of his people, the Cathars, in their struggles with the Vatican. The heresy of the Albigenses or the Catharism that appeared in the 12th century in the south of France was named after one of the strongholds at the centre of the movement, Albi. It soon had powerful enemies as well as supporters. One of these supporters was Count Raymond, a Templar and ruler of the feudal district of Toulouse in the province of Lang Languedoc, the country of the open door and a hotbed of heresy. According to the Rosicurian records, he sacrificed his vast estates and wealth to maintain religious freedom for his people. It was in the Languedoc that the first universities of the liberal arts and science were established in the ancient land of Gaul. 
All these seemingly different threads of so-called heresy are singularly rooted in the mystic priesthood that left Egypt with the Israeli tribes. Rosicurians perceive the repression of the Cathars as the crucible in which the fires of the wars against the heretics were first fanned into the flames. The teachings of the Cathars had many similarities with the inner teachings of the Templars, and when they finally destroyed, they were finally destroyed as a cohort religion. Many of them joined that order. Jacques de Molay, a Templar leader, was captured and murdered after being mercilessly tortured to make him confess to spitting on the cross and performing idol worship, among other things, which he later recanted. For this reason, he considered a relapsed heretic, and on the morning of March the 18th, 1314, along with fellow Templar, Geoffrey de Charnay, he was taken to a small island on the Seine River and burned at the stake. As the flames licked over de Malay's racked body, he confessed to being guilty of one crime only, that of confessing untruths about the beloved order while under torture. While he was being burned, he called upon Philip and Clement to meet him before the Supreme Tribunal, Within the year both were dead, Philip died on April the 20th, a little over a month later, and Pope Clement on November the 29th of the same year. The dark age that began with de Molay's death and the harassment of the Templars was to last until the European Enlightenment. The motivations as to why this course of action was pursued against the Templars are complex. For the sake of simplicity, we will adhere to the commonly accepted reasons. King Philip had been financially indebted to the Templars and was, therefore, after the rumoured wealth. Pope Clement thought that they were becoming too much of a challenge to the authority of the Church and were now no longer required since the Crusades were ended. Clement, Clement and Philip were also re representative of the dark forces that attempted to crush the Cathars. We reiterate, the true story of the Templars shows that they had never went out of existence. The main body went underground, and according to the esoteric records, many joined other orders such as the Teutonic Knights and the Rosicurians, and, as we saw earlier, they also became a successful banker fraternity. Later in tandem with the Rosicurian order, they founded the Masonic order to make the teachings more accessible to the common man. What connects all the authentic initiatory orders is an invisible bond not easily understood by the uninitiated, and even at times by the initiated. This invisible bond unites the various orders into what is known as the Great White Brotherhood. One imperi imperi imperator explains that this organisation within an organisation like this. The Great White Brotherhood, on the other hand, is a school of fraternity of the Great White Lodge, and into this invisible brotherhood of visible members, every true student on the path prepares for admittance. The Great White Brotherhood was no visible meeting place, as the members never physically assemble. Any physical or organization, therefore, claiming to be the Great White Brotherhood is false. Hence, the real preparation of which we are speaking is for the purpose of ultimately being admitted by cosmic initiation into the Great Brotherhood, that herein, herein the Master will appear to the student who is ready to take him under personal instruction and lead him or her unto higher development, where some day mastership in the Great White Brotherhood is certain an assignment to service as an imperator, magus or hierophant, and some phase of the work on earth will then bring affiliation with the Great White Lodge, with the Great White Lodge. There is much between the lines of the above for those who have eyes to see. As to the history of the White Brotherhood, the roots stem from the Aryan branch of the Indo-European race which were, in fact, ancestors of the present-day Europeans. They were also known as the Great White Race, great in the sense that they were numerically great and white because that was the colour of their skin. The Essenes, whose name is interpreted to mean secret and sacred, were the main branch of this brotherhood. They were not a super race or demigods that wanted control over any other race, as past political leaders of a certain country tried to present them for his personal malevolent ends. Indeed, Ellie Waddell forwards the theory that the Germanic type is completely different from the Nordic or Aryan race and connects the Germanic race with the slave or serb people of mid-Europe. The Nazi so distorted the facts about this race that there is now a stigma attached to the name Aryan in popular mind. But let us not forget that anything that the parasitical elite wishes to destroy, they first demonise. Think for yourself. 
The mystery schools established an underground stream to quench the thirst for knowledge of the true seekers, those who are not duped by authorities in government and religion. A good metaphor that clarifies this is the search Neo undertakes in the Matrix. He is dissatisfied with his life because he knows that there is something wrong. He is not sure what it is, like a splinter in his mind. Once he embarks on the path he dis to, of discovery to find out what it is, there is no going back on his quest. The implication here is that once we drink of the stream of knowledge, our lives can never be the same again. Our world view changes forever and our lives become an everlasting adventure. This is not a new concept. There is contained in a 17th century Rosicurian document a story called the Parabola. The hero is a neophyte, or as he or she is known, who once started on his quest feels a strong wind at his back which cuts off the retreat. Should this particular course of action be decided upon? Of course, the authorities, controllers, will tell you that pursuing this course of occult or hidden study is a sin and is dangerous, quoting the story of Adam and Eve, who became like gods when their eyes were open. Far from being a sin, this story should be celebrated as a metaphor for the dawn of consciousness for a humankind. This would not suit the parasitical elite, of course, who can only retain power over us by keeping us in ignorance of who and what we really are, and that is accomplished by obscuring our true history. So this is the conclusion, people. We travel with our mysterious tribes as they fled from their devastated prehistoric homeland into Central Europe, trying to escape the terrible catastrophe that had been visited upon them. We have seen how controversial authors Emmanuel Velikovsky and Commons Bowman, amongst many others, attributed this to a comet. A torrent of large stones coming from the sky, an earthquake, a whirlwind, a disturbance in the movement of the earth. These four phenomena belong together. It appears that a large comet must have passed very near to our planet and disrupt disrupted its movement. A part of the stones dispersed in the neck and tail of the comet smote the surface of our earth in a shattering blow. We discovered that there is an abundant evidence in mythology and legend to demonstrate that this is to be a plausible theory. Even in Velikovsky's time, this speculation was not original. Ignatius Donnelly wrote about the catastrophe years before Velikovsky did in his book Atlantis, The Antediluvian World, first published 1882. Much more evidence could be accessed from various sources to support the theory of a comet hitting or coming close to Earth and causing upheavals all over the planet. Ancient records show when the race poured southwards in reoccurring waves and over aeons of time into Iran, Iraq and finally into Egypt, they demonstrated their awesome knowledge by building the pyramids and birthed Egypt's golden age. Proposals put forward suggest it peaked in the 18th dynasty with the reign of Akhenaten but subsequently collapsed. Akhenaten Moses then led Egypt Israeli tribes out of Egypt to begin their return journey home. His daughter given her name to these tribes that birthed the Scots-Irish-British nation. It has long been a mystery to Egyptologists, although for political reasons some will deny this, how the Egyptian pharaonic age seems to arise already developed from nowhere. Works by authors like Waddell and Bowman had already made the connections between these ancient British tribes, sometimes called Atlantean and Egypt. The British Isles and Scandinavia admittedly comprise of one of the oldest land surfaces of the world and, as there is reason to believe from archaeological and other evidence, one of the first inhabited by primeval man. They form part of an ancient continental surface, the old redstone, and at no considerable distance of time Britain was separated from Norway by no more than the width of a river estuary. The original bed of the Rhine, formerly this region of the Old Red, later called Hyperborea by the ancients, enjoyed a wholly delicious climate, Bowman. And so far from these ancestral Britons having been mere painted savages roaming wild in the woods, as we are imaginatively told in most of the modern history books, they are now, on the contrary, disclosed by newly found historical facts to have been from the very first grounding of their galley, keels upon old Al Albion shores, 
over a millennium and a half of years before the Christian era, a highly civilized and literate race, pioneers of civilization and a branch of the famous Phoenicians, Waddle. Ideas from various non-establishment authors suggest that the northern peoples predate the Middle Eastern civilizations by some time, demonstrating northern Europe as the cradle of civilization. However, that is only half the story. We also accompanied them as they turned north, their original exodus by this time having been forgotten by the masses, looking for the land of their ancestors after being ejected from Egypt and hounded from the Holy Lands. On their eventual return to Ireland, they rediscovered the ark that preserved the seed that saved humanity and made possible the repopulation of the earth. The returning tribes, under the direction of the sages, excavated and reconstructed, restructured the ark into a model of a virtual tomb, womb, complete with a model of the cycle of fertilization to commemorate the human race's survival. There is evidence of settlements at Bruna Boyne up until 800 CE. An accurate chronology of this ancient race has been lost in the mists of time. And of course, Newgrange was discovered in 1699, nine years after the Battle of the Boyne. We discovered that William and James, not so much engaged in religious battle, but actually created a cryptogram by staging an ancient ritual battle. Whoever deciphers the clues left in the landscape will receive the key to the pass through the portal and become a witness to this ancient ritual battle which leads to our hidden history. Finally, the idea was floated, uh, floated that the Orange Order celebrates, probably unwittingly, the great exodus and their connection with the Egyptian-Israeli tribes annually in Belfast. The next two chapters will present the evidence for this and describe the symbols of the solar ritual. All that is asked for of the reader is to remember the sage advice, which is worth repeating, of Herbert Spencer. There is principle, which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all arguments, and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is contempt prior to investigation. We hasten to the goal of our cyclic journey, where we will be spectators of the first Osiris ritual ever performed outside Egypt in the mystic land of Bruna Boyne, Ewan. But first, the stage must be set. Olden memories ye have gladdened, hearts by sorrows cloud o'er cast, when some voice we let has told us, to the present speaks the past. Point to deeds that time has blazoned on the shining scroll of fame. E. W. Ewan's so guys, that's the end of that chapter. And here's some of the footnotes. I'll just slowly go through them so you can pause and check out some of these. I hope you are enjoying this, people. And we're a good bit through it now. I think there's only a couple of chapters left. The next chapter is chapter 5, Background to the Ritual Battle. The falsification of history has done more to mislead humans than any single thing known to mankind. Rousseau. Okay, people. I will see you in the next chapter and have a great week. See you later.